you're watching a segment of the Shiftcast. If you want to catch the full episode, you can check it here on the YouTube channel or on Spotify. Let's get right into it. How are you feeling today? I'm feeling great. Uh, definitely appreciate you guys reaching out. Excited to uh, chat with y'all. Yeah, yeah, super excited. So we've got um, we've got some stuff here that we want to talk about. We're going to hand the, the mic over to Yens for now, and he's going to lead the way. Obviously, Michael and I will chime in when we have some questions or, or some things that we want to add in. But Yens, the floor is yours. Take it away. Yeah, I mean, I'm just excited to talk to Cloudfield because yeah. I have been watching RLCS, well, let's say Rocket League Esports, since... Um, I would say the RLC Grand Finals is the, the first thing that I remember. Um, like just before season one of the RLCS. And th that's the first thing I watched back on YouTube in the, in the VOD. And then RLCS came around and I started following more closely. And I was there in Amsterdam for season two. But you, Cloudfuel, have been instrumental in making it all happen, right? Because you were one of the people who actually came into the Rocket League scene, not knowing about its predecessor, Supersonic Acrobatic Rocket Battle, Battle, Battle Cars. And just- More time? Supersonic yeah, Acrobatic Rocket Battle, Battle, Battle Cars, actually. <laughs> Pretty good, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and you just flew in organizing tournaments left and right and helping everyone organizing tournaments so much so that it landed you a job with Twitch. Is, is that the first thing that you started off with? Am I right? Yeah, I mean, that was like the first, I guess, like official professional kind of gig that I got. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was definitely a whirlwind for me. Like it's it's weird for me to kind of hear you kind of like repeat it back to me because like in the moment as I was doing all that stuff, it was it was yeah. very much just like go with the flow as I'm talking to players. Like I remember talking to like Cronovi back before he yeah. was the Cronovi. Um, Steve Bills. Yeah. Yeah. It was Steve Bills at the time. And like just he hearing was. him talk about, you know, how much the community and it was very small, tight knit community at the time, how much they wanted to like eventually become an esport. And I'm like, I'm playing in games with these guys, watching them do all these crazy aerials and stuff. And I'm like, how is this not an esport already? Right. This should just be out there already. And so I just started doing what I knew how to do, which was run events. To be fair, I was not very good at it. I just had been doing it a little bit. So I think I had a little bit of a leg up there. And, you know, I, I just tried to help where I could. And it it just kind of started snowballing. And it's it's still kind of wild to me to see where it's gone from there. Um, but it is, you know, it, it's cool that you mentioned that uh, the RLC Pro League Grand Finals was like the first thing you saw, because that was the moment, I think, collectively everybody in the community was like okay this this can yeah. be something we had like ten thousand people watching and everybody was on the edge of their seats like psionics was there everyone was there it was such a cool yeah. moment and yeah i think that was like the moment where everyone was like okay we can do this like let's make this a real thing yeah yeah i mean it, it started off so quickly right it started snowballing so quickly because it started in 2015, 2016, eventually when RLCS came around, which is quite a bit later than a lot of the big esports that we have today, like Counter Strike, League of Legends, whatever. So it kind of makes sense to me that it started off that quickly because there was some precedent for big esports leagues, but it it's still it's still incredible to look back and see how fast it grew in terms of viewership in terms of prize money because it went from if, if you had a tournament with fifteen hundred dollars on the line total that was wow okay we've got something to play for and then all of a sudden you're talking about a quarter of a million million two million yeah and it's interesting because at the same time overwatch was becoming a thing same year uh rainbow six was also becoming big and like it was interesting it's interesting like looking back now at how those developers approached their games versus how Sionics kind of approached Rocket League, they, it, it felt like to me, at least kind of from the outside and, and even kind of chatting with them as we got to work together, it felt like an overnight success, right? Because yeah. I remember when Dave, you know, had the sort of infamous line of like, all right, I'll, I'll eat a bunch of bread if, you know, if we end up breaking more than 10K and it was, it was well, well over that. Um, and so, yeah, just kind of seeing like how they, they put so much focus into the community at first and, kind of left the community to figure out the esports stuff on their own. 
And some might say like, oh, okay, well, maybe they should have been more involved. But I'm actually really glad that it worked out the way it did because I think it allowed us as a community to show a hunger for it. And it also allowed for people like myself to kind of get, you know, my feet wet with tournament organization experience. You know, it allowed for people like James Bot to get his kind of like casting teeth and, you know, just kind of like figuring stuff out as we go. And, and so like it was interesting to watch, the, you know, like you said, the progression of it going from very community based where, yeah, I mean, the first events that I ran were, I, I think it was like a hundred bucks or something. And then it was like 500 bucks and then a thousand. And then RLC Pro League, I think, capped out around 5K, which at the time was like incredible. It was unheard of. And then all of a sudden the RLCS comes around and now we're talking 75K and it just keeps exponentially growing from there. So it's, yeah, yeah. it definitely started very quickly. It, like, especially looking back now over the, what, eight years or so, it definitely started very quickly. Yeah, it's, it's very funny to listen back to interviews with you from those times where you were <laughs> you were talking about how there were players who were actually getting paid when they were assigned to an organization. That was the first back then. And yeah. how that, that, that was, uh, I by Power was the first organization to do that. And right. then SK Gaming came in and Complexity showed some interest. So Flip it all, tactics. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It all went very, very quickly from there. And during those first season of RCS, you started off with a system with two splits in the first season. And at the time, you said that was because you only had some small tournaments running before that. So you didn't actually know if those players participating in those tournaments with only maybe a couple of hundred teams signing up were actually the best players in the world, right? So to be sure, you actually had a system in place with multiple qualifiers, if you can call them that, um, to, to figure out who the best Rocket League players in the world were when the game was just launching, basically, right? We're talking about the first year after launch. How do you look, look back on that now? Yeah, I mean, it was it was definitely an interesting time because I think Twitch and so I don't know how much people know this, but like Twitch and Psyonix came together at the beginning of 2016 to form like a partnership to make the RLCS. And that's how I got involved. Twitch hired me um, as somebody who like had a background and like professional stuff outside of esports, but then also was starting to do esports stuff. And so I came in to help them uh, help help them along with Psyonix to run the whole thing. And like the vision that we had, you know, it's interesting kind of looking back now and seeing where things have kind of changed over the years. But the vision then was like Psyonix really wanted to have opportunities, a lot of opportunities for um, up and coming players to prove themselves. But we also wanted to have sort of this like, I guess you could call it like a safety net or something where like there is an opportunity for those that have proven themselves to then be kind of propped up similar to what you see in like pro sports where, you know, once you get drafted in or you get, you know, brought onto a team, you're there for a while, right? Unless you prove yourself, you know, unworthy or whatever, but you're there for a while you're in the spotlight and it allows you to grow a name for yourself. It allows the fans to get to know you. It creates this longevity and this continuity that, is hard to do when it's just all open qualifiers. So we were trying to balance the two out. And, you know, admittedly, the first season, it had its flaws. You know, the split system was something we kind of borrowed from League of Legends. We did like a, a you know, a sort of a, a watered down version of that, if you will. Um, and like it worked to a certain degree, but it was, yeah, I mean, we didn't really know what, what exactly we had in our hands. We knew, yeah, someone like Cronovi is probably going to be one of the best players. But beyond that, it was like we kind of needed to let – everybody prove it right and i remember yeah. that first weekend that we we did the uh, first qualifier i got like two hours of sleep that weekend it was so crazy we were all like holed up at uh you know back then it was like nge studios or uh they eventually became a part of esports engine but yeah it was it was nge studios back then we were working with them to to do the broadcast and like the casters were there uh you know like josh and luke from psionics were there all of my folks from twitch were there um, and yeah, we were just like making that work and it, you know, it was on fire. Like if you look back at the forums and like the subreddit threads and stuff, it's, it was a crazy, crazy time. Uh, we did not expect anywhere close to that many players to sign up and to participate. So we were working with like a somewhat new system with smash GG. Like they had built that for smash for live events, this being an online event, 
it just meant, you know, there was so many more things you had to consider. And so, yeah, we, we really had to like kind of go through the fire and back to like figure out how to make this thing work. Um, and yeah, it's just interesting now to kind of look back at that and see the numbers in that first season, like 75 K wasn't really that much, but at the time and with all of the just forward momentum of, of rocket league, it was so huge. Yeah. I mean, everything was new to everyone, right? You had you coming in with before that, not that much experience in tournament organizer. You were thrown in the deep as well. You came, I think from energy logistics in the energy industry and yeah, then I suddenly was, yeah i was yeah. doing like logistics and customer service and like i i could kind of like you know use that to piece things together but there was right. so much that just yeah you, yeah. you have to like it, there's so much like on the fly type stuff you have to deal with like players not showing up when they're supposed to show up or players actually jo accidentally join the match when they're not supposed to ping issue there's just so many little things that i mean nothing out. has changed really yeah <laughs> and you just kind of have to be able to deal with it on the fly so it's yeah it, it was a very interesting time for sure and and the first lan as well right was in a nightclub yeah in yeah. los angeles <laughs> yeah oh, didn't man. you have That's... to rearrange the entire nightclub twice for for both nights we did and we had to clean the floors because it was so sticky because people <laughs> had like alcohol uh. the night before it was it was gross um but it was oh, also no. really fun it was like a very it was a very intimate thing like you really had to be there because that was the first time a lot of these players got to meet each other and i remember just being like like we flew scrub killer in. he wasn't even part of the rlcs and we we're just like dude you're gonna be a part of the rlcs someday let's just get you over here um and, and it was just it was just such a cool time getting to see everybody who had known each other online since you know they were kids getting to meet each other for the first time. And um, yeah, there was just something really special about that. Uh, again, like it, it couldn't work nowadays. It had to be like that, perf that perfect moment um, that early on in the, in the sort of life of, of RL esports. Um, but yeah, it, it was a, it was a really cool experience. Yeah. Well, then we got to season two and that's basically the reason why we've brought you on to shift cast today. We've got league play. Oh yeah. And now we've got be bringing lead play back with the shift summer league, and I know it's much smaller in in all aspects, but uh, we've obviously taken a lot of inspiration from your work back in the day, 2016. Yeah, when I saw that announcement, I was floored. I love that. Uh, it's it's something like I've, I've talked. You know, I still keep in touch with a lot of the guys, um, but I, we've talked a lot about. It. It's like you know, there's a lot of cool. You know, there's pros and cons to both systems, and there's a lot of cool stuff going on right now. But there is just something that's like really special about league play and being able to know like, all right, these are the teams that are in it. Who's going to come out on top? Let's see. And you watch it over the course of several weeks. That progression, it's just such a cool thing. So I'm, I'm super excited to see, you know, what you guys bring to the table with that and how it all kind of pans out. Yeah, well, we're completely new. We have some support, uh, fortunately, but uh, yeah, we're completely new to, to this as well. So. What are some of the challenges that you experienced when it all was new to you? Yeah, um, well, definitely scheduling, a huge part of it. Uh, not only scheduling around everybody's individual schedules and teams and whatnot, but also making sure that the season is interesting, right? That was mm -hmm. something I spent a lot of time, um, like DM Rawlings was our statistician back then. I worked with him and some other folks to like, try to figure out what matchups are going to be the most important at what time. Um, and if you look at, you know, pro sports, the way they do it, it's pretty smart. They leave some blinks in the calendar so they can put in marquee matchups, depending on how folks are doing within the season. We didn't really have that luxury. We had to build the schedule from day one. So we kind of had to predict like, all right, who's going to be the best? How do we save that match? So it's not the first match, but at the same time, we don't want the first, week to just be blowouts like so you kind of have yeah. to predict a little bit and of course things never go according to plan right uh who, who expected i buy power to not do so well right off the bat and then have this crazy comeback like it just you know whatever uh you can never predict these things but um yeah so there's a lot of that kind of scheduling stuff that goes in you also have to make it to where every team is still in it realistically at the end because you don't really want a team getting knocked theoretically out halfway through and then they've got nothing left to play for like we didn't have the promotion relegation system back then so you really wanted to make sure the matches meant something going all the way in um 
we ran into issues where, you know, if you had a certain match play before another one, then another team could theoretically throw if they wanted to. And that's never good. So you've got to like balance that stuff out. So definitely scheduling is a huge thing. Um, and then I think beyond that, it's just a matter of like making sure everybody understands what the expectations are. So like, Hey, you're going to play for this amount of time. You're going to have to be waiting for the previous match to get finished. It may or may not get done early. And if it does, you've got to be ready to go. And that's, it's difficult because as a player, you want to practice and be as warm as you can be before you get into a match, but the broadcast has to keep going. So you've just got to like balance those things out. And, you know, back then the players were so young and so new to this stuff that like there was no precedent of esport really within Rocket League. All they could look at is like, you know, like CS and League of Legends, things that you mentioned. But, you know, it, it's hard to like compare those things directly. So I think now there's been enough time that, you know, yeah, there's newer players that have come in, but there's been a precedent. People kind of know what to expect. They're, you know, they're coming in and they're playing with older players that have been around the block a bit. So I think it'll be a lot easier for you guys to, to kind of take the template that we put together and, hey, add some new twists to it to make it uh, ready for 2024. Yeah, I mean, hopefully we're getting we're getting some experienced admins and casters, and all that helps, of course, with making it uh, hopefully a, a great success. But yeah, it's going to be a much smaller version of whatever uh, the RCS was back in the day. But, but even season two, I mean, it was not nearly grown to how large it got within the time frame that you were working on as well, right? How was it, and, and what were the biggest challenges of? of how rapidly popular the esports got and with so many more teams and events. Yeah, it became really difficult to keep the system that we had in place because we needed more opportunity because it was very quickly becoming apparent that there were up and coming teams that could could challenge the top teams, right? Because at first the, the first season yeah. it was pretty clear like there was a top threshold and then there was kind of like this bubble group that was kind of small. And then there was everybody else. Yeah. But by the time you got around to like season three, season four, that bubble was huge. And I remember so many players pushing for some sort of like bubble league, which is kind of how the RLRS came around. Um, you know, having having two leagues kind of running concurrently was very tricky. Um, and it was meant to be like a way for us to to kind of like almost have like a minor league system that could go into the RLCS, but there was also like, we didn't want them to be considered anything but equal. So it was, it was a weird sort of way to, to frame it. Um, but essentially it was like trying to, to find a way to give those aspiring players who were basically good enough. They just didn't have the consistency, um, give them a way to like get into the RLCS. And, and the way we had done it before was with the qualifiers, but I mean, as you saw, in fact, I think you guys just wrote an article, which I, I think is great. Uh, Team Iris, right? Everybody yep. thought that Iris was, was like the next, they were the, the next coming of like the best team and it just didn't work. And it's like, looking back now, I still, that that's one that I'm like, man, I really wish things would have went differently. Uh, I wish that we would have had more opportunities for teams to make it through. I think it was a little... I think it was a lot harder. And I think that's the difficulty with league play versus what, what we're seeing now is like, again, pros and cons. Like I would say that this current system, maybe there's a little, you need a little bit more of the league play type stuff on top of it. You need a little bit more auto qualifications because it's a little too open in my opinion. But I also think the system that we had was a little too restrictive. There weren't enough opportunities. There wasn't enough, like prove yourself over multiple weeks and like really, grind your way in it was kind of like man if you have a really good day you're in and there's something cool about that too so it's like again it's there's there's pros and cons to all this stuff and it really i don't know it really comes down to like the organizers and what they want to see so it's hard for me to really like have a, a specific say on like what is the best way to do things um i think it's probably some sort of like combination of all the different systems but yeah that was a huge challenge back then is like trying to find a way to balance giving those teams that had been so good for so long, giving them that sort of auto qualification, but we also didn't want a team to be in there that didn't really belong. And that's where the mm -hmm. promotion relegation system came in. And personally, I was a really big fan of that. I thought that added some real cool, interesting twists 
uh, especially when like cloud nine was in there. It was like, what is happening? Right. This is crazy. But it like, it kind of lights a fire under, you know, the asses of the players a little bit, which is, is you need that sometimes. So I don't know. I, I think there's some really cool stuff that can be done with that system, but um, yeah, I don't know. It, it's, it's changed so much since then. So I, I don't even know if it's possible to bring that kind of thing back, but you know, as a fan of that, the way we did things back then, I definitely would love to see that at some point. What was your favorite moment from it then? Oh God, I, I could never boil it down to one single moment, but um, wow, there's okay, so right, many. A couple. There's so many. Yeah. I mean, I definitely would say like uh, Northern gaming winning season three was just un so unexpected, so unheard of. I felt so bad for that team because Maestro wasn't going to be able to like, they had finally gotten there. And then he wasn't going to be there because he had stuff going on IRL, but then turbo steps up and the like birth they, of a super sub. Exactly. Mm. The birth of a superstar. And that was such a crazy experience. Um, I definitely remember that definitely season one. Like there's just, it's hard to top season one, especially for those of us that were like around at that time. Again, just everybody getting together, the sort of like small, you know, arena vibes that we had there. Um, but season four was also so incredible, like having it at the MGM studio. And I mean, it was just it was the first time that we're like, oh, this is a huge place. And I mean, granted, it's not as big as some of the places we've seen since then. But at the time, it was like, yeah. OK, this is we're big time now. We're talking like Call of Duty levels like we're pushing up there. Um, I'm, I'm sure there's a bunch of other moments that I'm, I'm forgetting. But, yeah, those are some of the ones that kind of stick out to me the most. Yeah. I mean, we've talked about Counter-Strike already, and you've been following that since before 1.6, you said, and you've seen it grow and grow and grow into what it is now. I mean, I've been to a couple of CS majors there, some of the biggest esports events there are on the planet. But Counter-Strike has a couple of years on us. Just a couple. Just a few. <laughs> so how do you think... Rocket League compares to Counter Strike because it's a younger esport, but also it's developed in quite a different direction. And and in what direction do you see Rocket League go from here? Yeah, it's interesting comparing those two um, because I think Counter Strike definitely like there's some similarity in the sense that both developers were kind of hands off for a while, letting the community sort of decide things. Um, but at the same time, I think. I think if if Psyonix had not eventually been acquired by Epic, they might have ended up in a very similar place with the systems that they were bringing together. Um, I know once the Twitch and Psyonix partnership kind of ended and then uh, Corey and, and Scheiss and those guys kind of took over things, they were pushing in a direction that was a little bit more similar to what CS and, and Dota has done. Um, but now it's like, yeah, they're... The system that's in place now definitely feels more like, well, I mean, it feels like Fortnite, which is what makes sense to me because that's what, you know, that's that's Epic's biggest game. So, um, yeah, they're, they've definitely gone in very different directions, I think. I mean, CS is not without its issues as well. I mean, there's a lot of people that um, would prefer it to, to go one way or another. So, I, again, I don't think there's any, like, eSport out there that has it exactly perfect. But I think uh, when looking at Rocket League and, and just the simplicity of the game and how quick the games can be, I think one thing that always seems to be a struggle for organizers is, is that they, they tend to go like the best of three, best of five route, which, I mean, you could see the way I did things back then. Um, and it wasn't just me. It was a whole team that, that I worked with. We were very much more in favor of like the best of seven, best of nine. We were even talking best of 11 at some point. Wow. Like I look at something like CS and I feel like when a team wins in CS, like they've truly won, right? They have grinded to get to that spot in rocket league, especially in the earlier like qualifier type matches. I mean, a best of three at this point is not much more than a best of one. You win two games and you're in. And like, when you're that good, anybody can win. So I just feel like that's that's an area where I would love to see more. I'd just love to see more games is really what it comes down to. Um, and I know some organizers, like shout out to uh, um, PRL back in the day, they were experimenting with like golden goal type stuff and like 10-minute games versus like five-minute. Like I, I love that kind of stuff. 
I know the pros probably hate that because they're used to a specific way, but I love the experimentation because I feel like Rocket League is one of those games that it doesn't just have to be the way we've always played it. There's so many things we could do. Um, I've always wished that non-standard maps would become part of the the tradition. Like I'd love for that to be something where like teams have a non-standard map in their back pocket. And like, when you go play against them, you play at their non-standard map, you know, um, stuff like that, I think could be really cool. I know Sionics kind of leaned away from that. They went more the let's make things even across the board, which makes sense to a certain degree. I think, especially in the early days, but yeah, I'm, I'm hoping as time goes on that we lean more into the experimentation. I think we're at yeah. a time now where like these players are just, they're pushing to the very tippy top of what you can do in the game. It's it's time to throw them some curveballs, in my opinion. I, I like the idea of bringing more attention to the grand finals, m making the, the way a little bit more because best, you see that best in of some three, best of fives. Yeah, of seven, something. Fives is the way. I mean, there's so many esports where the final Sunday is just a grand finals and a show match. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, and and that brings so much hype to just that one grand finals because everyone's there for that match, and you know which teams are gonna play. They've been stratting. I mean, I know Rocket League isn't that deep strategy wise, but maybe that can come to. I feel like the best of three, best of five is is gonna be the the golden standard for yeah. because you know why? Because best of fives, as Cloud said, are pretty volatile, which means it would probably likely go to a final third set. But at the same time, you still have to win six games to win. Like you have to win six games of Rocket League uh, instead. So it has that sort of like you have to be the better team over the day. But at the same time, because of the volatility of best of fives, you'd be really it would kind of be like tennis where it's like usually in sets. like, a, yeah. yeah, in the sets, like, you know, the worst player will still probably take a set. But the best player usually wins because there are just so many points in the game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Cloudfield, you've mentioned it. Twitch hadn't, didn't continue running RLCS. Sailnix basically took over, right? So how was that for you to have your role being reduced? Yeah, I mean, it was, at the time, it was, it was definitely frustrating for me. Um, to be fair, I was not, you know, I don't know how much of this I can share, so I'll try to you know, try not to get myself in trouble, but you know, the, the agreements between Twitch and psionics, those were above my pay grade, right? That was like on my side, that was Nick Allen and Justin Delario. That was kind of handling that stuff. And then eventually Robin Alleman, um, who we all went on to do Twitch rivals afterwards. Um, and then on the psionic side of things, that was like Josh and Luke and, and like Jeremy and, and Dave, uh, who was the CEO at the time. And so like, my understanding now, looking back, is the agreement was that Psyonix and Twitch were going to work together for a few years, and then Psyonix was going to take it over, which makes sense, right? Psyonix is a new company, um, newish company, and they had mostly done like contract work. And so this was like their first big break, and they wanted to focus more on the game and kind of leave the day to day organization of the events to a team that had been doing that. And so I had joined what was known as the Twitch esports team, um, which was filled with a bunch of folks from all you know different groups uh, uh, and different games and communities. So we had a lot of collective experience, um, but not specifically on Rocket League. That was more what I was focused on as well as uh, James Villar or James Bot, as y'all know him, uh, who joined me later on. So yeah, at the time it was definitely gutting because like we loved Rocket League and I, I didn't want to stop. Like I wanted to keep doing it. Um, and to be fair, I did have an opportunity to join Psyonix. I ended up choosing to stay at Twitch. You know, I, I don't know. It's it's hard to look back now and say what was best because I ended up getting laid off from Twitch earlier this year. So you never know. Um, and I still have a lot of love for, for Rocket League. I think for me personally, I thought that I was going to still be able to be involved with, with Rocket League, even though I was going to stay at Twitch. And I also thought that maybe I would have the opportunity to work on a lot of other games as much as I love Rocket League, I do love a lot of other games too. So I thought there could be a way to, you know, do both. Yeah, James I mean, let it be known that Cloud Fuel once was a Guitar Hero pro. Oh, somebody's done their homework. Wow. <laughs> this <laughs> is true. Impressive. This is true. I did. Uh, I did win a competition and got to perform up on stage, which was uh, that's awesome. quite something. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so James ended up going with Psyonix, which I mean, that was the best move for him. Um, he's, he's killing it over there. Uh, nothing but love for James. So yeah, it, it kind of split up the dream team, which 
you know, sucked at the time. But like looking back, I think it was probably the right move because I think Psyonix needed to kind of take things in and, and like figure out how they wanted to do things. Um, I'm still a big fan of like Corey um, and Shice and like they brought in Ian and, and some other folks. Uh, Gilly was awesome when they brought her in like that team. It took them a little while to get going, but man, they they were crushing it for a few years there. Um, and of course, it's all changed now. You know, Epic's had some layoffs. I mean, the, the industry, let's be honest, the esports industry has been in a rough shape for the past year or so. So, yeah. you know, n- nobody's been able to kind of skirt around it. Everyone's been affected to a certain degree. But yeah, at the time, it was definitely, you know, a little demoralizing. Um, but I, I got the opportunity to still work within Rocket League to a certain degree with Twitch Rivals, which was awesome. I got to work more with the content creators and like, you know, who do you were in one of the events? You know, you got to see oh, yeah. kind of like the pros and the content creators come together. That was a really cool thing to kind of do. So, yeah. Yeah, we I, I mean, I'll speak for the content creators. We love Twitch Rivals. It's uh, such a cool opportunity to get to compete in a like and obviously uh, it's like a pro am kind of vibe, right? Like you have professionals that are actually good and then you have people that are not the so football good. one, uh, football but one th- was those like are so fun turn. because you get to compete in, in a you know a semi-competitive environment so you kind of get that that feeling that the pro- professional players get it's definitely a fun thing to be a part of the football one was incredible the yeah football incredible. one it was yeah. like genuinely like top five yeah rocket league events i've ever seen it was so ridiculous and it was so entertaining <laughs> yeah it's such a great opportunity I mean, that was one of the things we had thought about as well back in the early days of rocket league um esports is we wanted these like i remember talking with uh, my boss about it like we wanted these players to become superstars right we mm-hmm. wanted them to like have the opportunity to get their names and faces out there just like you think about the greats of call of duty league of legends like all of them have you know, somewhat household names at this point, right? We wanted the same sort of thing for Rocket League. And by having, you know, the systems that we had that kind of created this, you know, opportunity for the top teams to continue to stay at the top, it allowed for that to happen. And Twitch Rivals was ended up kind of being a derivative of that, where we focused a little bit more on the content creators. And, and it was also meant to be like a system for retired pros, right? Someone like Rizzo, perfect example of like someone who, Played at a very high level, super charismatic, great personality, transition very easily into becoming a content creator. And like Twitch Rivals is meant for that sort of, you know, that kind of vibe. So yeah, Hootie, you're, you're right on. It's meant to be like that pro-am style where really anybody can be involved in it, regardless of your skill level. And it's more about the fun, um, which I know it, it kind of rubs some people in the RL esports scene a wrong way because it's not exactly what they expected. But I, again, I'm a huge fan of like, Rocket League is a game that can be played so many different ways. So I've got nothing but love for folks like Lethemir that like go out there and really try to push the envelope of what can be done. Um, so yeah, I, I I really hope to see more of that stuff in the future. I know that like Epic's got you know the whole Fortnite system with the the UEFN stuff where you can build custom maps and whatnot. I'm really fingers crossed. I know people are a little salty about the rocket racing thing, but fingers crossed that the the hope is that they're doing something where eventually all of Rocket League lives within this whole Fortnite UEFN system. And then folks like Let the Mirror could just go crazy and build all the custom maps that we've seen on Steam, but now they're available to everybody. And then all of a sudden the world blows up and Rocket League's bigger than ever. Like that's my dream. So yeah. we'll see if it comes true, but that's what I'm hoping out for. Yeah, because right now it's just one French dude, I believe, uh, Icas, but uh, something who has been trying to build his own map creator within yeah, Rocket that. League. That's very cool. It is very cool, but it yeah, cool. it's just one guy trying something. Yeah. Um, I wanted to touch on something that you said really quickly uh, about how it wanted to make these players superstars. It kind of made me think, and I don't know if you or, or Hootie or Jens agrees, but it does kind of feel like the league play kind of figureheads, players, the Garrett G's and Justin's, K-Dops, Turbo's, they're almost deified in a way that the newer players, and maybe it's just because they're newer, but I think of someone outside of like, ah, even so, like players like Zen, Fatira, Atomic. Monkey Moon. They don't, they don't, yeah, Monkey Moon. They don't feel like they have the sort of prestige, that household name factor that I feel like the Squishies and the K-Dops did. Do you think that the open system, while, you know, like you said, it has its pros and cons. Do you think because the open system sort of, exposes the lack of i guess uh 
discretion between the top teams and the bubble teams. So you have things like Carmen Court missing a regional despite being considered like a top two team. Do you think it almost it almost more like makes them seem too mortal? And that's and that, and that reason that's why you don't see as many of these players become like almost like you know gods within the esport. Yeah, I certainly think it's a lot harder for someone to like really stand out now which to a certain degree makes it even that much more impressive that Zen can do the stuff that he does because like he's doing that despite all the odds. Right. But that being said, like he's kind of the rarity, right. Vatira is up there as well, obviously, but like there's, there's only a few that people are like, Oh yeah, these are the best. Right. Because like you said, you've got so many that are in contention that theoretically any given day, any of them can make it in. And so when you don't have that consistency, yeah. And like you could argue that, OK, well, what's better for the esport having it to where the teams that are all within like earshot of each other in terms of skill all have a shot at, at competing and any one of them could win. So there's that uncertainty. There's something to be said about that. But then there's also something to be said about the consistency. Right. And I think when you look to like pro sports, which we don't necessarily have to mirror that, but that what is that that is what was there before us. So it's the easiest thing to look at. When you look at pro sports and the way they do things, and you can even look at like League of Legends um, and other esports that have that sort of league system where people orgs buy in and they've they got that continuity. The difference there is like you have names that stay around. Yeah. And then the change is the new folks coming in, the, the folks that are kind of trailing off, they go out, they go to a new team. But when you have completely brand new teams every single time, players changing left and right, it's just really hard from a viewer perspective to get engaged with it. And it also doesn't help when you have so many matches that are happening. It's like, I'll be honest, like I, I've been around Rocket League Esports since day one. It's hard for me to keep up. It's hard for me to keep track of what's going on. And I know if I'm having a hard time, newer players got to be having a real tough time. So again, there's pros and cons to it. It's, you know, this might be better for some players. It might be better for the TOs, but I don't know if it's better for the viewers. And you've got to find a way to balance all of that. And again, there's no perfect system, but it's like, I don't know. I, I, I feel like there's still more to come from Rocket League Esports. I still like, I still think that there's a better way to do things. Um, and I know that, you know, Epic has fully taken over at this point, right? They're, they've got a new system in place. They've got Blast Esports running things. Blast is going to have to, you know, kind of figure things out as they go. And it seems like they've, they've, you know, from what I've seen over the past few months, you know, anytime they did something the community didn't like, they instantly changed it, right? They came in, they're like, oh, okay, we'll fix that. So I love seeing that personally as a TO, like that's really good. So I, I guess to answer your question, yeah, I, I do think league play makes it a lot easier to have those names become synonymous because you have to have, you know, it's, it's a habit, right? The more you hear somebody's name, the easier it is that, you know, you can just recall that and, and get to recognize them and their skill. The more you see them every Sunday or every Saturday or whatever day the competition is going to be, uh, you know, it, it's just going to make that a lot more likely for, for people to get to know them. Um, that being said, I think there's also a lot of onus on the players. And this was kind of a, a meme back in the day, but like build your brand. It's a huge yeah. thing, right? And it's something that like is still prevalent today. And for whatever reason, you know, in my experience, some players, you know, they, they kind of geared themselves that direction and other players really didn't. They focused more on just straight competing. And I would say that, again, there's got to be a balance between the things, because if you're not out there, if you're not making yourself known, if you're not building your brand, if you're only reliant on your skill in the game and the amount of times that you show up on the big stream, you're limiting your chances to like really make yourself something beyond this. And there's been a lot of incredible players that have come and gone. And if they didn't really make a name for themselves, where are they at now? Right. It's hard to say. So it really comes down to what people want. Um, but yeah, I definitely agree with you. I think league play makes it easier for those folks that are really, you know, kind of the best of the best or close to the top. It makes it a lot easier for them to kind of stand out and, and have consistent opportunities to get themselves in front of the crowd. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, I think it's, you know, you talk about building your brand, but I think that that is part of building your brand. When I look at the most successful esports organizations within the Rocket League ecosystem, they're almost all tied to a single player. Who And that player's, like, I think of NRG with Garrett G. Garrett G didn't start, like, grinding content until COVID, but he was already, like, a 
the equivalent of a household name in the game. Same with Justin. He doesn't do YouTube Jane apps with G2. I think there's something to be said about when you stay, when you, when, as an organization, if you're always in the pro league and you have at least one or two players that are always in there, think about space station as well with the players they've had that helps everybody, right? That helps everybody like be the, you, the, you, the org gains fans, the players gain fans. I think it's important. And I think it's something that we're starting to lose. Uh, and, you know, maybe is a, a point of concern. The problem is that there's enough players who were really good, like Monkey Moon, who would have had a really tough time getting through RLRS into RLCS. Hmm. Well, one, of, one, sort of, one of the things that I was going to say, too, is like, you know, we've talked about these different structures and systems that leagues implement. I think you've got to cater it or tailor it to the time, right? Because seasons hmm. one through six, there was not the same level of talent quantity wise right like it was a smaller pool of players that could actually compete at an rlcs or even basically the entire world was like a minor region right now. exactly and now you've got a developed game an esport that has existed for almost a decade at this point and so maybe you know the system that would have been ideal in early seasons is not the ideal system anymore you know things change things grow and and you got to adjust and adapt as well i don't i don't know exactly what the uh you know perfect situation is um but i think it's something that is probably not like the nfl has existed for forever and it's got its system and it's going to keep rocking right like we know what it is but rocket league has not existed forever and and it's still experiencing ebbs and flows and so the the you know the structure of the the professional circuit and the professional league may have to reflect that and, and adjust with the times i um oh sorry go ahead I would say, yeah, I definitely agree. It's it's like you couldn't take what we did the first four seasons and just slap it in today and make it work. Right. It wouldn't. It would have to be some sort of amalgamation of what we currently have, what we had before, and figure out the best way to make it work. I do think there is definitely something to be said about having some sort of continuity yeah, at agreed. the top. Like it doesn't necessarily have to be league play. I think a couple of years ago they were doing something where there was the auto qualifications and like that helped mm-hmm. to a certain degree. Yeah. I'm also sure. a really big fan of the wild card system. Um, I think that was something that like, you know, I know they've moved away from it, but I'd love to see that coming back. Um, sort of like last chance qualifier wild card sort of thing. So I do think there's like, like you said, it's like you could take elements of the yeah, different systems yeah. and make your own new system that's reflective of the time because you're hundred percent right. Like the players nowadays, like there are players nowadays that don't even come close to touching the, the, you know, the top upper echelons, but they would dominate anybody from previous eras. Right. Right. You know, it's just like, people are so good at this game now. Mm. Like there's I, so I, many. yeah. And there's so many of them. So it's like you, you, it's really hard to, to make a system that works perfectly, but I do think, yeah, you need to have something where there is, I don't know, make it where it's hard for teams to get in, but once they're in there, it's hard for them to get out to. Well, even on the flip side of, you know, you're talking about continuity and you brought up names like Rizzo or Jane Apps and Garrett that have been there forever. But you remember the waves that Justin made because it is hard to break into that upper mm-hmm. echelon. And he True. did. And once he did, and he's not alone. I mean, he's an extreme example, but you've got players like Arsenal and Rettles. They still have big brands. And, and you know, part of that is what Cloudfield mentioned where you build that brand and content as well. Um, but they were not, and, and full respect, but they were not, immediate superstars in the same way that Justin was. So they're not that extreme example like a Zen or a Justin or a scrub killer, but they broke through that barrier that we're describing where there's continuity and these new faces pop in there, even mist or gyro, you know, um, and they haven't done content to the same degree. So yeah, I, I fully agree. I think there's a balance to be struck that may be missing at the moment where we're, it's so fickle right now. It's so volatile. There's so much change from, I mean, split to split, you know, we had a split, this season, we had a team, Redemption, right? And they, two-thirds of that team, joined one-third of another team under a new roster resolve. It's like, it's just this constantly revolving and changing thing that, and you guys have all said it, it's hard to latch onto and be a fan of a specific team or even a player because here they are bouncing around so frequently. Yeah, I'd like, and I'd love to get your guys' opinion on this. It's something I think about all the time because I want to see the best version of, of Rocket League at an esport and i think you know as cliche as it is because it's car soccer i really do think that mirroring the way that european football is is the way now it would be a massive undertaking and it would it would be a massive investment but 
the idea of having a larger domestic league play expand, let's say 16 teams with a promotion relegation to a second domestic league play on top of a completely open domestic cup. That's maybe double limb the whole built, way through. It's built in and game then, using the club system. Yeah. Come sure. on. Let's cook. Well, that's that's too, that makes too much sense, Hootie. Please. Um, <laughs> and then on top of that, I think you can almost like the best teams from those domestic leagues in each region qualify to a sort of touring circuit of international play, somewhat mm. like a Champions League or yeah. a Europa League. Uh, to me, that feels like a, a like it, like I said, it would be a massive undertaking, and it would require a ton of money, and time, and effort. People that it will probably never be done. But to me, that makes the most sense. It, it combines a ton of open competition but when you're at that top and maybe even you give orgs that spot those spots you don't even sure. give the players the spots in that highest level of like international play where you're actually going region to region having lands and then like all that culminates in like some sort of final land um but do you guys ever see you know rocket league sort of expanding to a point where you almost you have multiple s tier competitions throughout the year or do you think that epic is going to like really hone in on making the specific RLCS the like premier competition and we're not going to get any other type of stuff going forward. It's tough to say. Um, I, I love your, your, your thought process there. And it's, it's interesting because like many years ago we did this, this sort of like mock UEFN thing and it was, uh, or not UEF, U, uh, UEFA thing. And uh, we got the teams to sort of play as the different uh teams and it, it was really fun and like i always thought that there was something within that doing that sort of like multi-tiered league system i thought was really interesting i'd personally love to see that you know maybe you guys could do it at some point like do it as sort of like a, yeah. a summer event in between uh the bigger things just to prove you know prove the concept and show what it could be um but to your point about whether or not epic's going to do that i my experience in working with epic and seeing what they've done with uh fortnite they definitely seem to have been of the mindset of like making one top tier system and everything filters into that. And you just have like multiple opportunities to get in. And it's like a cyclical thing. Every three months you go, you start a new season, you rinse, repeat, do it again. Um, that's not to say that they couldn't change, right? They're, they're working with Blast Esports now. Uh, you know, they had some success at the end of last year with the FNCS Invitational, which was a LAN event. I personally am a huge fan of like live events, obviously. And I hope to see, you know, like I've always had a dream that like having a world cup where, you know, you have Fortnite and rocket league together, you have like rocket league taking place yeah. inside of Fortnite. Like it's getting there, right? We're getting that place. It's totally possible to make that happen. So I'm hoping that they're open to like making the systems a little bit different, but based on what I've seen so far, I think it's probable that they're going to continue down the road of, pushing everything towards the RLCS. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense because they would like to control what they have, and that's the way to do that. Um, back to season two, I want I would like to get your reaction to this, uh, Cloud Fuel. I'm going to bring up some bad memories, maybe. Um, what are your thoughts when I say that 59% is larger than no. 61%? Not a kid. <laughs> oh, I had man. to do it. I, I thought those days were behind me. Um, I had to do it to you. Yeah, that was that was rough. Um, it really just came down to the rules not being clear enough, and like the intention of the rule versus the rule as it read. And uh, you know. At the time, it was, you know, I was working with um, Mike Brancato, who's now, I think, the VP over at uh, chess.com. And he's, you know, he's somebody that comes from, like, the Smash world. So he's very, like, you know, he's got a very specific system that he likes to use. And, um, yeah, so we had something that was kind of put into place based off of that. And I think we didn't really factor in. I, I think I'm trying to remember back now. It's been a while since I've thought about it. But it was, like, a match win percentage versus, like, uh, something else and, and like yeah so we're talking about the european uh yeah it was like flip side market league. yeah yeah exactly so northern gaming won the regular season by going five and two with uh uh 17 and 10 uh game score and then you had flip side in second and mocket in third 
based on their percentages, 61 and 59%. But initially, Mokit was actually in that second spot and that made a big difference. Yeah. Because the top two immediately went um, into the second stage of the Yeah, they had the playoffs. Auto, auto bid. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those learning situations where, like, you try to think about every possible scenario, and that one just snuck by us. Like, we should have we should have had that figured out. Um, thankfully, you know, the community called us out on it, and we were able to resolve it. Uh, it was a rough time, <laughs> that's for sure. And it, it, you know, looking back, one now, of the wildest twenty four hours it, I can imagine. Oh yeah, and it it makes for a funny meme. So you know, it's it's good to look back and laugh now. But at the time, it was I was sweating. That's for sure. <laughs> Right. Well, you have a lot of experience with league play, so I would like to ask you this. What advice could you give us for the Shift Summer League? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think, like I said earlier, definitely focus on scheduling, uh, you know, between trying to accommodate the players and, and their availability and whatnot, and also trying to make sure that the you're staging the matches throughout the season based on, you know, what you expect to be sort of marquee matchups. Obviously, things are going to go wrong. Teams are going to do well that you didn't expect. Teams that you did expect are not going to. Like, it's just going to happen. But I think, you know, put a put a little bit of, like, effort into that to try to make sure that every weekend or, you know, every day that you have a match is exciting. There's always one to look forward to, at least. Um, that's going to be like that, oh, that's that marquee matchup. I can't miss that one, you know? Um, I think that's a really right. big thing about league play is, like, having those marquee matchups that everyone sort of pencils in. Um I mean, I remember back in the day when it was like, oh, when's the NRG C9 match, man? I got to make sure I watch that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so stuff like that, I think, is really important. <clears throat> Obviously, rules are really important, as we just discussed. Make sure you've you've thought about every scenario there. Don't make well, mistakes that I we mean, did. <laughs> honestly, you copied most of the RLCS rules, so it should be good. Yeah, but, I mean, uh, yeah give that a shot. But yeah, we, yeah, have yeah, region, yeah. we have region lock, though. Oh, okay, no, no more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no, that's no, no. not. No, no, no. That's not going. <laughs> that's not getting past us. Good, good. But uh, they should be available on uh, shiftrlyg slash SSL um, for nice everyone plug. who wants to check them out. So yeah, hopefully it'll be a good summer mm -hmm. event, and hopefully we get to do more of them. Hopefully, I'm super excited about it. Um, I. So I am just a Rocket League guy. I always say this. I'm not, not really into esports or gaming, which I know makes no sense. But um, I come from the sports world, and I think Rocket League being so sport-like just grabbed me, and, and you know I fell in love with it. But I want to ask, um, because there's a lot of discussion about Rocket League and how can it grow. Um, like Jens even talked about it earlier, I think relative to some of its esports peers, there is less strategy involved. Um, it's a lot about execution in those, within those five minutes. Uh, mechanical execution at that, not just like a game plan. And so one of the things that I'm always curious about for, you know, perspectives uh, from people that are into other esports and other games, um, what what is your take about Rocket League's potential to grow? Um, I think we know that it is kind of a high, hmm, how do I say this? It's obviously easy to understand and pick up the controller and play, but it's very hard to be any good. And, I, and when I say good, I mean, we're, we're talking about like gold level, right? Like just basic mastery of movement in the car. Because I can remember, I had to play with car cam because when I would go to ball cam, right? And the ball was behind me, right and left was inverted. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I couldn't do that. My brain couldn't do it. So... Rocket League has a, a relatively high barrier of entry skill-wise. Um, and then obviously the skill ceiling is like it's, it's still going up. So it's got its strengths, but I also think simultaneously those things are kind of weaknesses. There are so many people that I've talked to that's like, I tried it and it was way too hard. I did not have fun. You know, it took me, it's going to take me forever to get good at this it game. It probably took me 100 hours to actually Absolutely. hit the ball consistently. Absolutely. So anyways, I'm rambling here, but my, my point is Rocket League, is so unique it's hard but simple it has no direct peers you know you've got like valorant apex call of duty and i know that they've all got their own flavor but it's still a first person shooter um and rocket league doesn't have kind of i guess cousins or something whatever so what, what do you think 
or what is your take about Rocket League and its potential for growth? Or, or if you have any suggestions, what, what do you think Rocket League could do to help aid its growth? Yeah, those are all really good points. And like, those are things that we thought of very early on. Yeah. I remember having a lot of conversations about like, you know, like you just said, it's like that, that low barrier to entry. I mean, it's gotten harder now, right. Than it sure. was back then. But at the right. time it was a low barrier to entry to like be able to get in and play the game, but it was really hard to get good at it. Like you said, but on the, on the flip side of it, it's really easy to watch and understand what's going on. That's I right. think Rocket League has done a great job over the years in terms of making it visually appealing. We really struggled in the early days of like, we had to have like observers and, the auto cam was a whole thing, you know, all of that's kind of in the past. And now we have some systems that work and we've got observers and things that, that make it look really, really good. Um, but in terms of like similarities, you know, we've always thought that the closest thing was actually the FGC um, yep. because yeah, it, it's, it's a fighting game, right? So it's like, it's simple to understand one person wins, the other person loses. Yep. You don't necessarily know all the combos that go into it and all the complexity behind it, but you understand the concept and it's really easy to watch. It's all kind of contained in a single frame. Um, so that was kind of the similarity that we thought of. And when I look at the FGC and the way they've kind of progressed, and obviously there's a lot of different games within that, I look at Rocket League kind of in a similar way where like, you know, the community has been what has really championed the the progress of this game. And that's not to say that, you know, we haven't had support from Twitch and Sionix and Epic along the way, but we got that support because the community demanded it. The community proved that there was a hunger for it. And I think that has to continue. I think I would love to see, and I'm, I'm so excited to see what you guys are doing this summer. Um, I would love to see more of the community supported events. That was something that I mean, as somebody who came from the community, I love seeing TOs get the opportunity to work with the developers and work with like, you know, the folks that are running the big scene to make things happen because, I mean, that's how I got started. And I know that, you know, as a fellow TO, like we have the potential to do some really awesome things. We just need the opportunity. So I love seeing that kind of stuff. I think that's really good, not only for giving sort of undiscovered um uh, players a chance to sort of like prove themselves but also undiscovered talent casters tos whatever right it's it's everything um so i definitely want to see more of that kind of stuff but if i'm being honest that's that stuff is going to be great for like the inner sort of community i don't know that it's necessarily going to push the envelope in terms of where rocket league goes so right. to answer that question and it's a tough one um i think that the, the stuff that i would like to see rocket league do is more collaborations with prominent figures out there in the in the world whether it be sports celebrity whatever um there was a little bit of that a few years back and it kind of went away but it's like it's one of those games that like everybody can play everybody mm -hmm. understands what they're getting into you know and it's it's fun and it's different like you said there's no it's not like cs and valorant that are competing head to head it's not you know warzone apex PUBG all competing head to head there's only one rocket league there's nothing else like it not even sports games, right? Those are all very different. So I don't know. There's just something really iconic about what Rocket League is. It, it marries the sort of soccer experience, the sports element with the racing. You know, it brings all that together. And so I don't know. I would just love to see more of that kind of stuff where it it leans into those kind of celebrity uh, yeah. opportunities. And I know they've done a little bit of that over the years. And I, I just want to see more of that. I also think more opportunities for – and this is something I was working on when I was at Twitch, more pro-am type stuff. Like the pro stuff is awesome. Don't get me wrong. People love the pro stuff. But pros are not always on the same level of celebrities in terms of fandom. And I think yeah. that's something that I wish had been done better over the years. I look at someone like a John Sandman who's been there since the beginning. And I'm like, how does my dude not have a flag in the game like right. right like he's been killing it for so long and like he's gotten to a point now where it's it's hard for him to like have the same level of interest that he once had because there's not a lot of like community fun stuff to do and so i really want to see you know this is this is a plea to epic like i see the stuff they're doing with fortnite i want to see that stuff come yeah. to to rocket league Give us the opportunity, give the, the Lethemirs of the world the opportunity to go out there and create really cool, fun stuff that allows people to just be playing the game all the time. 
Like people live on Fortnite. Like my kids, one of my my youngest kid plays Fortnite all the time. He lives yeah. on Fortnite, right? It because it's it's, it's a social hub at this point. I want to see yeah. the same sort of thing for Rocket League. I want to be able to like go in there, play a, a, a traditional game of Rocket League, go do something else that's Rocket League esque. Like I want to be able to yeah. just all that stuff together. Mm-hmm. And I think like that's gonna bring that's gonna bring that level of like you talked about the the barrier. It's gonna bring it down a little bit because now all of a sudden it's not just hop into a, a casual, which let's be honest, it ain't that casual anymore, or a competitive match, right? And, and get get my ass handed to me by some really good players. No, I can hop in with people that are just kind of goofing around having a fun yeah. time. Yeah. I remember back when I was playing, we would do we would come up with the wackiest games. We had like um box golf where like you would have the square cube ball and you'd like made it to where like the floor was lava and you you couldn't let the ball touch the floor and like we just made up our own games we play we take the double goal map and like each player had to control one goal one side of the goal and if if you got scored on you lost a point like we would just make up stupid stuff like that but it was so much fun and like i mean i think like you know shogun and and johnny boy they did a lot of this kind of show matchy silly game type stuff as well um gibbs has like his whole gibbs uh show thing like that kind of stuff i want to see more of that to where it's not up to us to our use our imagination but we can actually work within the system to make these things a reality because then all of a sudden it's like you're you're taking the the concepts of like a a a mario party and you're adding that in so it's it brings down the the skill barrier for people that want to just get in and have a good time but guess what as they're playing they're unknowingly getting that's right that's and right. As they get good, they rank, you know, they, they rise up the ranks and they get yeah. to the pro level. So I want to see more of that kind of stuff yeah. for the bottom end. And then for the top end, I don't know. I just want to see some more consistency. I think, you know, Yenji had some really good points about the league play stuff. I want to see, I want to see some posterized people. Like I loved how big, you know, KDOP was like on top of the world mm. for so long. Turbo was on top of the world. I want to see more of that kind of stuff. Um, and, and I think the best way to do that is to, to have that continuity, I, again, I know it's it's a hot topic, but finding a way to marry the systems in a way that gives up and coming teams the opportunity to get in. But once they're in, they're in for a while, and they don't just instantly come back out. They have to they got to prove themselves worthy to get in, but they also have to be proven worthy to be knocked out. Like find some way to make that happen. There it is, Psionics. Take notes. There we go. Get to work. <laughs> Cloud Fuel said it, so <laughs> don't get it from a higher authority. That was a segment of the Shift Cast. If you want to catch the full episode, you can check it here on the YouTube channel or on Spotify. Thank you for watching. Catch you next time.